Hey everybody, welcome to LynxCast. I'm your host, Matt. And I'm Tyler. Alright, so we're not starting late at all. Like, not even a little bit late. We're starting right on time. What's that line from As Lord? always. What's that line from Lord of the Rings? A wizard is never late, Bilbo Baggins. We r- arrive precisely when we mean to. <laughs> uh, something like that. We uh, are wizards here, so yes. <laughs> definitely wizards. Anyways... Welcome to Linux Cast. We talk about Linuxy things. We have a really good podcast queued up for you guys this week. We're gonna t- we're gonna actually do a Linux distro tier list now. For those of you who do listen on the audio, just gonna put this out there right now. We're gonna do our best to make sure we're always saying where we're gonna put what distro. We're not just gonna put the logo somewhere and then don't say it out loud. That way you can actually follow along. I will also take a screenshot of the finished list when we're done and put it in the the description for the audio listeners if you want to take a look at it. So that way, also you can obviously go up on Monday and watch the actual video and watch us do this. So I th- it should be fun. Should ha- we should have a very entertaining time. But before we jump into ranking the best Linux distros, because we already know which one's the best, we don't really need to even do this. Uh, open Susa. Uh, <laughs> uh, sure, whatever. <laughs> uh, anyways, before we jump into that, we're gonna do what we always do and talk about our week in open source. So Tyler, my friend, other th- other than deciding to build your computer five seconds before the podcast begins to start, what what, what have you been up to in open source this week? Well, I have been, I have, actually, I've done a, quite a lot with my Nix OS, like Zany OS repo. It, for anybody who doesn't know, I've got on my GitLab, you can go find a Zany OS repo. It's for my Nix OS configs. I've talked about Nix OS a lot, so I'm pretty sure most people are, are aware of what I've been up to. But if you go over there, if you want to try out Nix OS, you like Hyperland, you, you like want a pretty nice theme set up with all the niceties already enabled, like nice animations, all that stuff. You can go over to that GitLab repo. I've I've got install instructions. They're pretty comprehensive. Uh, it's not like a three step process. It's like nine or ten steps, but it ensures you don't hit any like roadblocks or anything like that. I've got it. I've got. A lot of things already pre-configured. If you're using a different setup, like with different hardware, Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, all that stuff, like it should, hardware should function just fine. Uh, I also made a wiki. I've been working on that quite a bit. I've got a, I, I've heard from a lot of people that I did a really good job on it. And I think I did a really good job on it. So it explains what is Nix OS, why you would choose it, why choose my configuration how to use my configuration, uh, common issues that people run into that aren't necessarily something I can just fix, like the Hyperland plugin loader. When you update your system, there's a chance that the headers will change for it. And so you've got to, you have to reboot. It'll throw a whole bunch of errors. The plugin will look like it's destroying your system because it just keeps spawning in and there's new errors, but you just got to reboot the stuff like that. I've put in the wiki. That's mainly what I've been working on. And then uh, last night I started putting together my Intel Xeon system. So I've now got 16 cores, 32 threads, and 64 gigabytes of RAM. So I feel pretty nice. And to Nix OS's credit, I did not have to reinstall, do any of that BS. I literally just booted up back into the same drive. Everything worked exactly as it should. I just have to regenerate my hardware config so that Intel microcode gets loaded and I'll be good. Well, I am happy that you were able to get everything up and running well, because I was quite worried for you. (laughs) Well, I mean, it would have been fine if I had just done all of this and figured out that, like, you know, even though the board says Wi-Fi, it doesn't actually have a Wi-Fi chip in it. And I didn't even think about that while while building it. If I hadn't have fallen asleep last night, I probably wouldn't have made this podcast late and probably also could have had a chance to shower before I did the podcast. But, you know, whatever. we, we can all smell you from here. We know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, just so everyone's clear, like I had to move my entire desk. Me, my mom helped me move my desk with my monitors, lights, everything attached to it through the house into this room. And then I had to set everything up and I. I got to be honest, you said you'd, you'd wait like an hour for me. I got it all done. But pretty nice. <laughs> it was it was more like an hour 15, but it was close. It was it was very close. Um, I was it's very... close enough. We'll call it an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Uh, the, the chat and I had a, had a very good time 
talking behind your back <laughs> about, good, about, good. About, about how there's no way that this is going to go r- right. There's definitely going to be something wrong. Audio is not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, audio did not work, but the funniest thing about it is it wasn't even that audio wasn't working. I accidentally dropped my audio interface when I was setting up the desk in here. And when it fell, it pulled out the aux cord that hooks into the the actual like output for my speakers. So everything was working properly. And you saw me. I was trying to figure out what the heck was wrong. And then I realized that just <laughs> still aux cord wasn't working. And there was random music playing in the background. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. So since the last time I did a podcast with you, I have switched 100% to Wayland. I'm using Hyperland and I'm, uh, I posted a video about this last night, so I'm not spoiling anything. And I, I, I like it. I think I'm ready to finally say that I've switched to Wayland full time and I'm, it's working and I'm happy with it. As you can tell, happiness is not the expression on my face at the moment. <laughs> like, uh, I did this out of boredom. I was very bored with Xmonad and I needed something to do. So I decided I was going to give Hyperland another try. And I've had a fantastic time because because of Darth, I haven't done a lot of racing lately. So I, I've missed sitting down and theming my computer. And I was able to do that. And it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, I I've rediscover- so I learned all of CSS. I was re- really really good with CSS back in like 2010. Now that was a long time ago, and CSS changes a lot. So I had to re- actually relearned a lot of my CSS so I could do Waybar, and that's been a lot of fun. So I've been doing that, and I have been fighting with Vivaldi because every time Vivaldi has a update, it, it borks like horribly borks and so i finally did get it working and then i pinned that damn thing so that it open as it won't update it anymore <laughs> ever again i don't care how, how insecure it gets i'm never updating vivaldi again because it just breaks every single time also i've i switched from zipper to dnf5 on open and have decided that that's probably the way that i'm going to go for a long time because dnf5 oh goodness man it is so much faster than zipper like i did a 547 package update in less than five minutes that would have taken at least 40 minutes on zipper like it's not even okay close. yeah it's like phenomenally faster it's awesome now it has some downsides but for the most part it works really really well and i'm, I'm very happy with you with it also fedora Get your shit together, man. Get DNF five out the door because it's so much faster yeah. than DNF four. Like it, it's it's really good. I I really hope that because they've been rewriting Zipper now since 2016 to include parallel downloads. I hope that they just stop what they're doing and just start over again and, and mimic DNF five because it's so good. But anyways, yeah, that's basically what I've been doing. Uh, I I've oh also just to prove that OpenSUSE is the best. I uninstalled Plasma and everything that goes along with Plasma and. You know when you uninstall a desktop environment, usually it takes things along with it that you didn't really want to uninstall? It did that for me. But OpenSUSE handled it like a champ. It uninstalled SDDM and just decided, well, you know what? LightDM Light is installed. Just use that. Like, there's no other... Dis- oh, it, just, yeah, just, it, it just, just literally fell back? Yeah, it just went to LightDM. And, and that's awesome. Because you know, like if, if on any other distro, if you uninstalled your display manager, you'd be put right into a TTY. Like automatically, yeah. no. Nope, this one went right to right to Light DM. Now Light DM didn't work well with Wayland, but that's a Light DM problem, not a yeah, not a, a, a Open Suse problem. But yeah, that was an awesome experience. I didn't even have to do a, a like a a rollback or anything to a, a snapshot. It just worked perfectly fine. Also, while we're while we're talking about what we're doing in Linux. I did also want want to ask you, since you've had 64 gigabytes of RAM for like a while, have you ever tried doing a, uh, like a temp FS or like, you know, loading your root system into RAM and also doing it with a game file as well and like running a game straight from RAM? No, my RAM, when I don't use it, just sits there and be sad, <laughs> basically. Oh. Uh, well, I'm I'm looking to so here in the next like two or three weeks, I'm going to get another 64 gigs of RAM, and so I plan on once I have 128 gigs, I, I plan on putting my 
root on, you know, in RAM doing that because Nix OS does have a pretty easy way of doing it. The extra thing I'm going to do is try to see if I can install a game to that persistent directory as well. Just one, like the game I play the most frequently. And I want to see if there's like, if it just like, if loading just disappears, like it's no longer a thing. Yeah. I really want to see that. But so I'll, I'll, that will be an update for the, here in the next few weeks. I'll put, I'll talk about that, whether or not that works <laughs> or if it's worth it. Eventually I'm going to be doing a, like a NAS or something. All my games will be on there uh, because I'm running out of space on my internal S, uh, uh, NVMe. So that, that'd be my experiment is to figure out because I, I want to be cheap. I don't. So Josh sent me a, a case that I can build a NAS in. And I want to do that, but I don't want to have to deal with hardware raid. So I'm going to do all of it software raid, and I have no clue how to do that yet. So that's going to be some, that's going to be a learning experience. Well, I'll just go ahead and let you know from everyone I know who's messed around with software raid and done a lot with it. It's gonna it's gonna be a pain in the ass. Like it's it's gonna take time to get used to, and you're gonna run into issues. But over overall, it works. So you should you should be fine. It'll be something fun fun to watch or fun fun to learn about because. I've never. The last time I did raid, I was a Mac user, and I bought a. So this is the stupidest thing. I so there used to be a company called Drobo, and they sold these big gigantic raid hardware raid enclosures. I had an eight hard drive enclosure. It cost like three thousand dollars. Gotta remember, this was like 10, 15 years ago. So everything was super expensive, and it lasted for about a year and a half, and then it just fucking completely died. Like, I don't know, the hard, the power supply or something like that died. And the, the company had, was the crappiest support company I've ever experienced in my life. I was like, you know, that's my last experience with a big, gigantic raid box because I'm not spending that much money ever, ever again. And, you know, just so I, this time I'm going to do all software raid. I'm not going to mess around with any of that stuff. I'm going to and I'm, I've debated either building in that case that Josh sent me. Uh, or just getting, because there's like really cheap mini PCs and you can buy like an external hard drive enclosure. And I'm thinking that's yeah. what I'm going to end up doing because it's, it's so much cheaper. And then I don't have to build anything. And I, <laughs> I, so I built my computer, the one that I'm on right now. I built it from scratch all the way from the ground up and I had a good time doing it. But I've come to realize I'm also shit at it. Like I'm not really, I'm not, just, I'm not good at it. My hands are huge. And there's, especially the, you know, like the, the little cables that go in for like the power button. Yep, the front panel connectors. Yeah, yes, those things are a pain in the ass when you have huge, gigantic man hands. Brother, I don't. I have closer to feminine hands than you do, and it's a struggle for me. So I totally get what you're saying. Like that's gonna be a pain in the ass. Some motherboard and case manufacturers will basically just put them all together in the order that they're supposed to go because it's the same on every board basically and you just slide it in it's just one one connector but some of them have those like little like plastic things that are have been standard for like the last 30 years and like first off i'm definitely breaking one of those cables like it's not even <laughs> not even a question i'm gonna pull on it too hard or something and they're they're so little and you can't really you can't ever really plug them in until the motherboard is in the case i mean everything else uh -huh. you can put together while it's outside of the case and it's fine but those little things you got to get in there and they're always right towards the bottom it's just a pain in the ass so uh, i, I can't or, or then you want to route your cables and you get your cooler put in so you can grab the motherboard and slide it in you slide it in put it in then you realize you got to put in the eight pin power connector it's super close to your heat sink and your fat hand won't slide down through it like oh. yeah no i get what you're saying yeah, yeah that <laughs> cpu connector that's always in the upper left hand corner it, it, it is so hard to get to especially once you have your you know like your cooler or whatever connected already and, and then the the 24 pin is always so fucking stiff uh, that you yep. that you can't and, and you got to bend it over. It's like I got it's got like a pull a J. Like you got to pull it. You got you got to you got to turn that thing around. around. It's like it's so. Uh, it was it was a fun experience. I did it during COVID and it, it you know. But I, I've had that experience. I don't need it again. So I don't know what I'm gonna end up doing there. But I, I've been pricing things out and everybody says like oh storage is so cheap. I'm like yeah, storage is cheap. Still a hundred and seventy dollars for an eight terabyte hard drive. And if I want five of those things, that's not actually cheap. Is it cheaper yeah. than it used to be? Sure, but so is 
you know, well, nothing else is cheaper than it used to be. <laughs> I can't come up with a good. Enemy. An another point too is like a lot of people think storage is so cheap because they literally have a small library of games at most and then just a normal system. So like for that, yeah, storage is super cheap. If you go buy an eight terabyte hard drive, you'll be set for a long time. Like you're, you're fine. But like, you know, if you do something like we do, like where you record footage a lot, oh brother, eight terabytes, you could fill up in no time, no time. So um, I, I wouldn't say storage is cheap. It just depends on what you're doing if it's cheap. Nay says I should mount my PC to the wall and have an open air system. Dude, I live on a dirt road in the country. And that means... That doesn't mean you can't have nice things. Come on now. No. Come on now. Dust is what I'm saying. It's like you live on a dirt oh. road. You're going to have dust up the... I have my computer in yeah. a case and it still gets dustier and shit. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, I don't even live on a dirt road and... I've got, but my dog comes in my room and I've got this new case has got mesh filters on it and it won't matter if it's anything like my, my old case that I had that was nicer and had mesh filters on it in time, I'll get dust in there. So yeah, putting it on the wall is probably going to be a maintenance nightmare. So yeah. <laughs> also, I mean, these are sturdy walls. They're not going to fall down or anything, but the rest of my family have a tendency to slam doors all the time. And I'm very, very, very worried that somebody would slam the door really hard and that thing would just come crumbling down. Uh, but also, just to tell a story here, Tyler and I have known each other for a couple of years now. And we've been doing this podcast together for a couple of years. I shit you not, there was a point uh, during this podcast, during the time we've been doing it, where he had his computer in a cardboard box. Mm -hmm. That actually happened, okay? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, like, so for him, cases are actually blow at some point. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, and then, and, and almost like directly after that, it was like during his BSD days where he had his computer. He was building. You had like, um, you had like a card or a cooler or something like that wouldn't fit in the case, so you just had a case with no sides on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, oh, oh my God. I remember that. Yeah. I, I literally had it like the case was completely open. Like it was the case was only being used to mount the motherboard. That's it. Like, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't trust that guy when it comes to cases. <laughs> I mean, this is what, what I'm saying. <laughs> well, look, it, if, if your main concern is front panel connectors and breaking them and stuff, don't go with a cheap case because I can guarantee you every single $50, $60 case I've ever seen, the front pedal connectors are cheap, short, and they're not together at all. They're always some little dinky things because this one ticked me off. This one was like 60 bucks, and it had those. I have a NZXT 500 something or the other. It's the computer that has the least airflow it's like they decided some little bitty pinholes along the side was all the holes that you needed in a computer case surprisingly it, it, that's the one where the is the isn't the front panel just a solid piece of like plastic or metal yeah yeah so all metal there's a glass side and then along the one side in the top there are some pin pinholes it's Fine, I actually get fairly good temperatures, but it's still not the most airflow. The good news is it does keep a lot of dust from getting in there, which is nice. So, because if air can't get in, dust can't get in either. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, all right. So let's go ahead and move on into the main topic. So this this time around, we what we decided to do is a Linux distro tier list, and we, I will actually put this up on screen. And I have a approximately 94 logos set to go of many different distros and of course i have a whole bunch of them that are, are duplicated because i have a, you know reasons for that because i need different sizes i just literally so i have a whole full directory of distro logos i just upload them all <laughs> So, uh, there's some of them here. I don't know if we'll, it will even rank. There's like a couple of them here that I don't even know what they are, to be honest with you. Like, uh, I, I can actually tell you what, the, what they are. So, that'll be a fun experience. But what we're going to do is we're going to rank the distros that are that I've uploaded here. And if we have time, we'll come up with some other distros if we need to. Uh, and uh, we're doing this in traditional tier list fashion. So, if you want to... Uh, follow along you can do so we're doing s a b c d i don't know what any of those things stand for because i'm not a, a gen z so <laughs> I, i'm an old millennial so i don't know any of this newfangled stuff going on but we're going to do it anyways so let me go actually put this up on screen so you guys can actually see this so 
and eventually Tyler will be able to follow along. I do have the chat there alongside because Vivaldi's awesome and allows me to tile things. It's awesome. It's great. Uh, anyways, so let's go ahead and get started. What I figured we'd do, Tyler, is that we'll have fights when we get to things that we disagree on. And yep. And it should be fun. So why don't we go ahead and start off with Nate's favorite with Pop OS. Where should we rank that? If I'm being honest, Pop OS, I... Ha- I I would I would give it an S tier even though I don't prefer its desktop. They're doing something unique with it and depending on your hardware, they're really the only good support to go with. Like if you've got a hybrid laptop and you just want everything to work and you don't want to have to do anything yourself, it like that's pretty much the only distro you're going to go with and have a great time. I feel like S tier's too high to be honest with you. Because it's, I mean, yes, they're doing their own desktop environment, but it's not out yet. And you're right, they do a lot of good hardware stuff. But other than that, they're just Ubuntu. Uh, maybe I'm being, maybe I'm being too tough on them. Do you think I'm being too tough on I them? I, you do have a good point. So maybe it should be a tier. But you, you're not, you're not completely wrong at all like they're not really doing anything else they're they're literally just making the ubuntu that canonical should make they're linux mint but with a different turn on things (laughs) 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 i'm gonna get a lot of shit nate's never editing for me again (laughs) pop os is his distro and i'm just here lambasting i gotta be the curmudgeon and he can't be the curmudgeon he's like 12 years old (laughs) <laughs> look at him he's the jonas brothers all over again <laughs> i can't help it such an asshole today it's sorry so no uh, so a tier you think can we agree on a tier do you want do you want to fight for your s tier i think i think a tier is good all right oops i put it in d tier <laughs> that was a mistake it was a mistake it was a mistake. i'm sorry all right let's go ahead then go to um Ardix linux I'm just randomly picking out one. Oh, so okay, this um, one's going to be difficult. <laughs> so basically, Artix. You have to correct me if I'm wrong because it's been fucking forever since I've even looked at Artix. This is just basically Arch Linux, but without System D, right? That's basically yeah, they what hate System D. So this is like yeah. Dev One or or MX yeah. Linux, something like that, right? Pretty much, yeah. I I agree with Waffles. Except just right, he put the wrong distros in there. D tier for Artix, just knock off uh, Arch. I I don't really I don't really have much. I I don't have a high opinion of uh, protest distros just in general. If you if you don't like System D, you can literally just install Arch and remove it. Like if if it's that big of a deal for you, I. I don't know why it would be that big of a deal. Like, brother, standardization has been a good thing in Linux. Like, just ask Steam. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so we're getting we're getting some people who are saying that it's S tier. Which, like, come on, <laughs> come on. There's yeah. like, there's no way this is S tier. All right. So I I think I agree with you that it's D tier. It doesn't. So uh, we probably should dis. We should probably define a little bit about d tier a little bit it doesn't mean that we think that they're bad okay if you use them you're not a horrible person and deserve to go to prison or anything just you know not as good as open Sousa, okay <laughs> well and and also i don't i a lot of people are saying c we could make a case for it being c but other than like, other uh, than uh, removing right. system d what did they do special? Like, like we gave Pop OS a lot of credit for doing something special, hardware support and creating their own desktop environment. Other than removing System D, what did Artix do that's special? Nothing. Yeah, that's what I say. I mean, if somebody in the chat wants to correct us and tell, well, they they did this, this, and this that we don't know about, we, we, and we're not saying that you can't use a protest distro. It's just that doesn't mean that. I mean. Yeah. And also, special. like, uh, just just because I made the comment that I don't have a high opinion of 
like protest distros doesn't mean I don't have a high opinion of people who use them. Like I don't, I don't care what you use. It's just personally, I would never go out and pick one. I don't think most of, and it, it comes back to what we just said. Most of them don't really provide anything else other than removing and replacing a specific thing with the regular distro. So like, all right. Again, I, I, someone in chat said it's definitely not the worst one. Look, D tier is not for worst distros. If we had an F tier, then we'd be calling out distros and be like they're utter crap. But yeah, yeah no, I don't think there's. I don't think I have any logos here that are for. Well, <laughs> there, there might be here some here that actually deserve F tier. Now that I think about it, <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll see. If, we'll see if we need one. We maybe may, maybe we can add a add a tier or something <laughs> if we need one. All right, let's go yeah. ahead and move on to. I'm just picking out a random one. Let's do Void Linux. Ooh, void. Void. Okay. We have to be cautious here because the void gang is scary. Yep. <laughs> to me, it's it's going to be a B or C because they're a, they're a step up from Ardix in the sense that yeah, they do just have their own like init system. Most people are are running void because it, they use run it or not system D. Well, I mean, they have but the at the end of the day. They do a lot of unique stuff. They are an independent district. Yeah, they, I mean, they have their own repositories and their own package manager. And, and you, if you wanted to run without, you know, the the, if you wanted to run without glibc, you could run with M Musil or whatever Muscle or whatever. So they do offer quite a bit of, you know, things that you can't get like really easily by doing a different distro. So yeah. I would say B. You, th you said B or C, yeah. right? I think B is a, yeah. a, a, a good place for Void Linux. Now let me find the logo again. So B, B for Void Linux. I think that that's where... There we go. All right. Let's go ahead and then go to... Um, let's talk about... Let's see here. How about Solus Linux? Ooh. I think we're going to be disagree on this one. Do you, yeah, I don't. I don't know that we may. You go ahead and tell me what you think. I, I think it's D. I think it has to be D. Oh, we agree. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because all right, it's not that it's bad. Again, really, the reason why I would say Solus is a D tier distro is simply because they can't make up their mind on what they want to do, and they keep changing bases. They keep changing. You know, from GTK to they wanted to go to QT, and then they were going to the the Enlightenment libraries, and now I don't know what they're doing, but they changed their mind again, and it just feels like they don't have a a vision for what they actually want to be. Although they they do, in their defense, have significantly contributed to a desktop environment of their own. So I. I agree with what you said, except I would phrase it a little bit differently. I don't I don't think they don't have a vision. I think their vision continually changes, which is not necessarily a problem, except you if you don't finish the last vision and you create a new one, and then you don't finish that one, and then you create a new one, it's not a good look. So, yeah, yeah I would say D tier. All right. We're gonna go to go to detail then. All right, Linux from scratch. Uh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> no, we might need that F tier, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I suppose we should ask: Should we even rank it, given the fact that it's not technically a Linux distribution? Because you have to build everything yourself. I mean, there's literally nothing there that's distributed. It's just literally you're pulling down every package and building it yourself. Yeah, I. I, I would have to say we need to make that F tier and put it there. All right, let me see if I, can add, add, if I can add an actual tier. I don't know if I can or not. We'll see. All right. Oh, add row below right there. There we go. And we're going to name that. We'll, we'll get a, go here to the settings for this. We're going to call this the F tier. Oops, that's that's a D, Matt. Not, a, not an F. <laughs> All right, there we go. So we're going to put Linux from scratch in the F tier. Like my, my thing with Linux from scratch is if you if you want to learn how distros like or how Linux under the hood operates, it's great. But also most people don't want to like you don't realize what you're asking when you say like maybe I want to learn that or like 
I should learn that. That's like 36 hours of work and you're going to end up knowing things about the Linux system that you probably don't need, to, like you don't need to or ever want to use. Like I know way more. I've said this multiple times, but because of Linux from scratch, I know way more about SysV and it than I will ever. ever. <laughs> I've never. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you could use, I, I think that, I think that like, MX Linux uses SysV and it. I might be wrong about that. I think that that's what they use. That's the only other one that I even think uses SysV and it out of the box. Well, SysV and it, like SysV and it has been like kind of obscure for like the past five years, if well, not more. It's like, the, it's the thing that came before system D, right? So it's been around for a very long time and you know, it's not that it's bad. It's just system D overtook it. And if you're looking for an alternative in its system nowadays, you go for run it or open RC or what's the one with six, six, it, six, it. Uh, there's never one, even heard of that there's one. one called six in it or something like that. It's a little bit more rare. Anyways. Yeah. I think, I think that the, the F tier kind of fits that again. It, I don't, I have a hard time saying like, Oh, this is, but it's just, it doesn't really fit in any other tier. All right, let's go ahead and then go to Fedora. This is just stock standard Fedora. We'll do, I have the Kino White logo. We can do that later. We can count those as different. Yeah, S6. That's the right one. I knew it had a six in it. I know we're probably going to fight about this one. And I know if chat's probably going to fight me on this one. But I think, if I'm being honest, I think Fedora is a B tier. Like, it's good. You can, you can probably use it for a long time without m much issue. But, eh, like... I don't know. It's not great, in my opinion. Okay, let me argue for A tier. I'm not going to argue for S tier. I don't think it's that good. But I think Fedora deserves to be up one tier higher than what you say, just because they are the paving ground for literally every technology that Linux uses. System D, Pipewire, you know, Pulse Audio when it was a new thing, System D when it was a new thing, Wayland... Literally everything that is new and that every other distro is eventually going to adopt and be standard comes through Fedora first. They are the guinea pigs of the Linux community. They test literally everything. And given the fact that that's true, it's astonishingly stable for what it is. Given the fact that it is a basically a beta testing ground for literally everything that Red Hat wants to push on all of us. Um, it's still a very good you know, distro and very, very stable. So I would push for A tier. What say you? Are you going to, are you um, going to fight for B tier? <laughs> I, I am still going to fight for B tier only because it is their testing ground. You are right. It is surprisingly stable for being their testing ground, but I don't know. Like the reason, the reason I would say it's B tier is a lot of the A tier distros that I assume we're going to have are ones that are focused on making sure the users have a working system, which is not Fedora's actual like goal. Like their actual goal is just to like improve technologies for the Linux desktop and literally have Fedora be a development environment well, they're... for that actual stated goal is to be a paving ground for rel is basically what we're saying here is it is it's a place where rel is born and then eventually gets filtered down into the stableness that is rel all right now, that, uh, now me saying that does not mean fedora like doesn't give a crap about its users like that's not what i'm saying but they don't have like your the user base is not their sole focus at all I, I will tech. I, I will capitulate on B. I th I still think it could be A, but borderline A B. All right. I, I think it could be an A, but I think it should be a B. All right. <laughs> I, I will. I will. Uh, I will live to fight another day on Fedora. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go ahead and go to something a little bit more obscure. Let's talk about KDE Neon, which I have two logos for, by the way. Ooh. KDE Neon is the paving ground for KDE Plasma. They say themselves as not a distro. They say themselves as not a distro. Matt, your English is fantastic. You are a writer, my friend. <laughs> I can't. I honestly don't. I, I mean, I want to say, I want to say B tier too, but 
I I'm going to go like, D tier, actually. I would say D because they don't even want to consider themselves a distro. They don't want people to use it. They, they, this it's literally just, they want it to just be for developers. They do provide a stable really? thing, but it's, they call themselves a testing ground for the latest KD technologies. And well, yes, you can get the LTS stuff and you can use it and it's stable and all that, but it's just, it doesn't feel like it's, what does it do? Like it's Ubuntu. It's we have Kubuntu already. It it exists. It's there. I will you, capitulate with you on D here because that's kind of. I didn't know they didn't consider themselves a distro, and I definitely didn't know they didn't want people using it. I well, didn't I, know maybe that. that's a little bit you know harsh, but they say in their on their website that their primary dis, uh, ISOs are the non-stable ISOs because that's where you're going to get the. You know, like the more recent versions of of KDE, the LTS version is based literally. It literally is just a more KDE centric version of Kubuntu. Which, by the way, I, again, it exists. We'll get there. I have a logo for it. Like it's literally right next door, right? So <laughs> I, I would just say, yeah, I'd say D tier, and you said that's okay for, with you as D tier. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead then. This is proving to be a very hard thing to do because I have some of these logos. I don't know what they are, so I'm trying to really remember what the logos are. So, like, I have a bird here. I think that this is Farron OS. I might be wrong about that. If they'll check, tell me if this blue bird here is Farron OS. If I'm right about that, you can let me know. So, let's talk about Linux Lite. I think I think that's what that's this. The feather is Linux Lite. Is it, is it? Yes. All right. So Linux Lite, I believe, is based on Ubuntu or Debian. I can't even remember. <laughs> uh, I believe it's Debian. Okay. I believe so. Yeah. So where do you think that Linux Lite should be placed? This one's a hard one for me because I don't really like, or not, I don't really like, I don't, I wouldn't prefer to use it, but I've used it before and it, it's really rock solid. Like, it works damn good. Well, I mean, if it's so. actually based on Debian, though, of course it works solid as a rock well, because it's based on Debian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what kind of work did you do there, friends? I mean, you see. Well, they've got they've got some of their packages are a little bit more up to date than they would be in just the regular Debian repos. I don't. I, I, as far as I know, I don't know that could have changed. Right, I'm so pretty sure. Where would you sure Where would you put it? I'd probably put it in B tier. Oh, really? With Fedora? B or C, yeah. Because, I mean, it's really easy to use. It's rock solid. They do the, they do, they do do actually do a lot of their own stuff. So. Uh, all right. I, uh, I, I, I can't put it as a B, man. It's just. <laughs> 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 can, 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 we, can we compromise on a C tier? Because we're, we're, we'd be putting yeah. it above Solus, above KD Neon, and above Arctix. All of which. It feels to me that they all those which we ranked as a D tier. I, it feels like all of those do more to be a distro than Linux Lite does. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. Maybe a D tier. May even cough. I may even go down to a D after you said that. Like, well, I mean, it's like I keep we, we we keep saying like it just doesn't mean that it's bad or anything. It's just yeah. I I, I would say soulless. KD Neon and Linux Mint are kind of in the same, or Linux Lite are kind of in the same sphere. Like they they do their own thing. Maybe maybe it should be a C tier only because Linux Lite has helped, and one of their focuses is helping older, like or I almost said older people, people with older hardware, hardware. Yeah, you know, keep around. All right, C tier it is then. Okay, let's go ahead then and do one that everybody's been waiting for, NixOS. Let's let's talk about NixOS because we're definitely not agreeing with this on this one. <laughs> no, no, we're definitely not. All right, so so uh, it literally has to be an S S or A tier. It it fundamentally has to. Does it have to be? Does it really have to be? <laughs> I'd be fine with putting it up there with Pop OS. I'd be fine. A I, I'm surprised that you're even willing to put it as an A tier. I would actually agree with you that A tier is a good place to put it. Be, and be, because they do a, just a ton of stuff, literally everything from scratch, because it's 
a distribution that does things completely differently than everything else. So, and they have a purpose for existing. They do different things and everything else. So I think I can agree with an A tier. I let me think about it. For well, a see here. Here's do you have an argument? Here would be my. Do you thing. have an argument for S tier? I, I want to hear it. If you have an argument for S tier over A tier. I do have an argument for S tier now as to whether or not everyone would agree with it is highly debatable. My my reason for it being S tier is it is extraordinarily simple to manage a system with NixOS. Like if you set up a system with NixOS and then you want to move it to another system, the odds that you run into issues, especially if you're doing something like I'm doing where you're actually configuring a lot, you've got variables to change out for different stuff. There's like no problem. The only thing is, is that learning curve because it is genuinely different. Like even though like installing Hyperland on most distributions is very difficult. You have to install the Hyperland package, which normally doesn't pull in the desktop portal that you need, blah, 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 blah. On NixOS, it's literally an option of programs.hyperland.enable. Like that, that's it. You just set that to true and you've got Hyperland. That being said, I understand some people have the argument of, well, I don't know that one liner for enabling it, so I've got to learn that. I get that, but at the end of the day, it's still easier than doing it pretty much on any other distro. That being said, I even though now I've made that argument for it, I still think it should go in A tier. I think that's probably... I, I don't think NixOS deserves to be above Pop! OS in the rankings. I think they're, they both do a lot to help people manage their systems or have usable systems just in different ways and different approaches. All right. I think a tier is as high as I would go as well, simply because it's not for everyone. I think that in order to be an S tier, you have to be a distribution that can work for everybody. Now, a lot of the distros that we've already ranked can be for everybody, but they have other flaws, right? Yeah. But in order to get to S tier, you had to be something that everybody would want to use. And I don't think that NixOS is there. So I think that you're right. A tier is where we'll go with, with NixOS. I'm actually I'm surprised that we were able to come to an agreement because <laughs> when, I, when I thought we're, we're doing this, I thought, well, you know what? NixOS is going to be like really low. I'm going to put it as a D tier distro. <laughs> I thought that for a little while, uh, but it's not that bad. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and then do another one that I think we probably will disagree on. Linux Mint. Let's piss off some Linux Mint, guys. Oh, yes. Uh, I'll go first. I think that this is a D-tier distro. <laughs> it's it's Ubuntu, guys. Now, uh, admittedly, they do do their own desktop environment, so I, I would be okay with saying a C-tier. And actually, now that I think about it, let's, I, I would say C-tier is where I'd put it. It's a protest distro, so at least that's why I would I would argue that it's a protest distro. It's protesting against the way Ubuntu does things because it does things as Ubuntu, but does everything differently than Ubuntu. And kinda, it, it is a distribution that doesn't have as clear of a focus, so it's kind of like Solus. So they've they've split their focus on Debian and Ubuntu. And I would also argue that they don't update as often as you would like them to see. So you're always going to be even, you know, Ubuntu has old stuff, right? Because it only releases every six months. But Linux Mint is older because it releases after Ubuntu. So I would say C at the most, D is really where I want to put it, to be honest with you. What do you think? I I agree. I think I think there is an argument to be made for it being B tier. But I, if you want to, I will compromise with you at C tier. Make no your, problem. Make your argument for B tier, but I'm going to tell you right now, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nate's throwing the, a fit me, in, in, in the chat. A tier, man. A tier. No. Just because it, a lot of people use it and it's popular doesn't necessarily make it better than anything else that's on the list. I'm just saying. Wait until we get to Ubuntu. I'm just saying. <laughs> Is what I'm I, I, gen I genuinely think the old, the best argument for Linux Mint being B tier is the fact that Linux Mint does a lot more for their users than Fedora does. So my argument for it being B tier isn't really necessarily based on Linux's Mint's merit. It's really built. It's really built on the fact that we have other distributions in the B tier that don't that not not don't do as much for their users, but Linux Mint 
arguably could you could say they do more or they do as much for their users as those ones in making their life easier. Okay, let me see if I can come up with an argument for B tier as well. Just to try to convince myself. They make applications. So things like Nemo, File Manager, obviously Cinnamon Desktop. They have that weird TV streaming service application that they, for whatever reason, decided that they were going to make. They have like a notes application. Uh, they are phenomenally bad at updating the Mutter window manager on Cinnamon. It's always significantly behind Ubuntu and Gnome. I guess that was a negative, <laughs> not a positive. <laughs> uh, uh, I have such a hard time. Fine, B tier. I, I don't. Uh, this is this is a protest of a protest distro. <laughs> Linux fit users, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You couldn't pay me to put it in a, as an A tier, by the way. It's, just, it's not. It's not there. All right, let's go ahead and when we. Uh, I don't even know if you know what this distro is. It's called Mubox. It's basically Manjaro with OpenBox. That's what it is. F tier. Okay, uh, I think I agree with that. All right, sorry, Mubox users. <laughs> like, I don't even think we need to have a discussion around it. All F-tier. right, let's see here. We're let's look for. So let's see here. I have Archcraft. Linux. This is basically a window manager version of Arch. It's an Arch-based distro. It has a ton of different uh, themes and stuff. It runs OpenBox and BSPWM and maybe another one, but for sure those two. And it is basically a theme changer script on top of Arch is the way that I describe it with those window managers installed already. With uh, what distro or what was the name of the distro? It is called Archcraft. Archcraft. Okay, I I thought I heard something different. So okay, I would give this one a probably a D or an F if I'm being honest, only just because it's literally another distro with. I mean, it's a, it's pretty much what I'm doing with my configuration. Like I got a theme changing script. I you you get a certain desktop environment chosen. Like. It's not, it's not really all that much going on, but I mean, I, I could, I could see it getting a D tier. I've heard a lot of really good things about Archcraft, like people at least like it and make setting up Arch easier. So Oglo does have a good point that it is very pretty. So they do a good job of rising, but I, I agree with you. I think D, I think I'll go with D tier just because I, I, I like their rices, and it so that does provide some value to having a, a distribution that is all set up for you, and you don't have to do the ricing yourself. So we'll put that in D tier. All right, Arco Linux. Uh, if if we're writing their website, it's definitely an F. <laughs> say yeah. Uh, as a distro, though, as long as we can completely take the website out of the equation, completely, I, I think Arco deserves a C tier. It does more than just looking good or making the install process simple. Uh, There is a lot of usability or um, user user accessible, nice scripts pre-written for you to do a whole bunch of stuff. Eric Dubois takes care of a lot of things like it. It's just it does a little bit extra than where I'm going to assume a lot of the arch ba- arch derivatives are probably going to end up in D tier and compared to a lot of them, it does do a lot of extra stuff, but I wouldn't put it up with like Fedora or like void. So, okay. So I'm going to disagree with you on this one majorly actually, and I'm going to okay. say a tier. And the reason oh, why I would okay. say a tier a tier is because it's with Arco. It's more than just a distro. First off, they were one of the first Arch-based distros that took Calamari's to its full potential. So before that, Calamari's did exist, but it was just a it was just an installer, just like any other installer. But because of their contributions, they were allowed to basically make it so that you can choose basically everything you want to install, right? You know, as the install happens, and not a lot of distros did that before Arco did it. Another reason why it is kind of less to do with the distro itself and more of the fact that the guy, Eric, does a ton of stuff. Like, he's basically 
made the Arc Arts Wiki, but better in, in YouTube form. And he has a ton of different videos. And every time there's a problem that comes through because Arch fucked up Grub again, five minutes later, Eric has made a video on how to fix it. You know, and it's on his, on his YouTube channel and tells you exactly how to do it. And if you Google on how to do anything on Arch and you need to learn how to do anything with any window manager or any desktop environment, chances are he's done a video on how to do that thing, even if you're not using Arco. So that's very valuable as, as well. Well, uh, hold on. So can we go ahead and agree that if we take into account everything that Eric Dubois does outside of the actual distro itself, like not saying that like it, it, he's not doing a lot with the distro himself, but if we include the YouTube videos, the posts he makes, and also like, you can just talk with the dude too. Like that is a thing. So if we count all of that extra in, I would agree that it should be an A tier because if we're being honest, a lot of people don't want to go read through documentation. And when it comes to Arch, a lot of Arch users that are using Arch are only using it because of Eric Dubois mm -hmm. help or his support. Yeah. Also all the tools like the, Arco Linux Tweak Tool, which is I think now called the Arch Linux Tweak, Tweak Tool, work on other Arch distros. So they created all the tools, and you can go, you can install that on Arch and use it to install all your window managers, all the rices that come along with it, all the tools and stuff. So it's not just as if the tools. I mean, like Pop OS and Linux Mint, which we just gave a B tier to, by the way. <laughs> and I'm gonna let you live that one down. <laughs> Linux Mint does all these tools stuff, but and yes, you can use them on different, you know, desk or distros, but they weren't designed to do that. Whereas the Arco stuff, they literally he literally wants you to use it on Arch and not just Arco. So I would still argue for A tier. Well, and also just so we're not giving Eric Dubois too much credit here, the reason he wants you to use them on other Arch distros is so he knows whether or not it's working and he's done his job correctly. So. Yeah, but yes, they are built for you to use anywhere else. So yeah, All right. I would agree, A tier. All right. Now there's gonna be so many upset Linux Mint users and Fedora users <laughs> in the chat. No, 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 oh. just wait until we rank Arch lower. <laughs> <laughs> like, just, just wait until we do Arch lower, because that's definitely going to happen. All right, we we, we got to speak. The MX Linux. Where should we go? Where should we put MX Linux? Based on Debian, uh, does not use SysMD by default. Has a ton of awesome desktop tools, uh, including one that allows you to basically create an ISO of your installed system, which is just phenomenal. But those tools are only MX usable, so you can only use them on that distro. And they do provide a systemd backup, so you could use systemd on it if you want to. So they're not a protest distro so much as they providing you an options distro. So and they also have a um, somehow have gamed distro watch. So do they get credit for that? <laughs> to me, MX Linux could be literally anywhere between an A and a C tier. Like it'd be it'd be hard to make the arguments for A or C. B you could you could easily make an argument for it being B, and it not be a problem. But the reason I say A through C is because like MX Linux is really good. They've got a lot of tooling. They, they're, they're really good. So you could make an argument for A. They're probably in the ballpark of everything in B, but you could also say it's very comparable to something like Linux Lite. Like they do have a lot of similarities in what they're doing. So I, I, I would say B, but that's just me. Um, well, I really like MX Linux. I think it's a fantastic distribution and I love their tools, but I, I feel like the reason why a lot of their tools exist are just because they don't use systemd. So they created a whole bunch of GUI tools that help you get past the fact that systemd is not usually running, but they also have other tools, things like the snapshot tool and the tool for they, they basically have a GUI for configuring Conky, which is freaking awesome because if you've ever configured Conky like ever, it is the worst thing to configure, like bar none. And the fact that they have a GUI to do it is pretty cool. So uh, I would say C tier right along with Linux Lite. I think that's yeah, and just just to kind of agree with some people in chat, we'll we'll call it a high C. 
Well, yeah, also, yeah. It's a high, so oh, you... I mean, I'll, I'll go I'll go and and I think Hip Dad said S tier. Sorry, guys, you haven't had an S tier yet. MX Linux is definitely not going to be it. <laughs> yeah, S tier is going to be hard to hit. <laughs> Well, I, I know I'm going to argue for at least one being S tier, but I don't think I'm going to get it. But we, we'll put MX Linux as a C tier. All right. Let's go ahead and do this just to piss everybody off. Arch Linux. Where are we going to put Arch Linux? B. <laughs> below, now, below Arco. <laughs> let me explain. Let me explain why I'm saying B. Okay. I don't want to go any lower on the list at all, but I can't go any higher on the list. Mainly because, uh, look, Arch is phenomenal distro. We all know it's a great distro. It it does exactly what you would think it it does. The only problem is is the community around it. In a lot of the cases, especially <laughs> vanilla pure Arch. Are you see the chat uh, right now. <laughs> you guys are all over the place. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love the last one I saw was Unsell. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I think it's the most active chat we've ever had. It's awesome. <laughs> Probably. But look, look. See, the reason I don't want to go lower on the list is because I don't want to put just regular Arch down with something like Artix or like MX Linux. I. But also at the same time, like if we're gonna if we're gonna be honest with everyone here. MX Linux and Linux Lite does a hell of a lot more for their user base than pure Arch does, like, if we're being honest. Okay, let me argue for A tier. Okay, and re okay. the reason why I say it is because without Arch Linux, here are the things that on this list that wouldn't exist. Arco would not exist. Let's see here. What uh, What's another one? Artix would not exist. Black Arch would not exist. Um, let's see, Zero Linux would not exist, Storm OS would not exist. I mean, there's just a ton of them here that would just would not be in existence if it weren't for Arch Linux. So, I, I think that alone puts them at an A tier. Uh, my, my agreement with you, though, comes in the fact that they do tend to be very not user-centric in that they break things in weird ways not just because they're a rolling release system but because they like pushing out the git version of of grub like what are you doing that, yeah. that's not a good that, yeah. that, no that's not that's not what you're supposed to do sorry steve yeah. steve tells us all the time that that's not what you're supposed to do so i'm assuming that that he knows what he's talking about i'm glad you said that because the amount of times i've had to listen to steve complain about grub and arch like the amount of times, every, man. Is, every podcast for the much. last year. <laughs> we love you, Steve. <laughs> that, that man has complained about Grub and Arch so much, which I'm not saying is a bad thing because he has to deal with that crap. So, like, I get it. But yeah, I, I, I could see it going in A as long as part of the reason it's going in A is because a lot of other distros wouldn't exist without it. Yeah, like. That would be pretty much the only re look their documentation. Yes. It's incredible, mm -hmm. it's another but just like all documentation, it can be hard to sift through and find what you need and you might overlook things. And when the entirety of the communities, like, well, I wouldn't say the entirety, but a good 90% of the communities like help is at the best, a link to a page in the documentation. Eh, not uh, great. This, this is hard. <laughs> yes, it is. Arch is probably the hardest one because we ranked Arco as an A. <laughs> Feels like we screwed well, ourselves. There. But Arco does so so much to make Arch better and usable. Yes. So shouldn't shouldn't it be kind of obvious that Arco would be All right. ahead I'm, of uh, Arch itself? Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and go B tier. B tier for Arch. Good lord. <laughs> We're going to get murdered in our sleep. All right. Well, <laughs> there there went 6,000 of your subscribers. Let's let's go. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We're, we're so going to die. <laughs> we're just going to get murdered. This, look, there's going to be memes about this podcast for years. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's do another one that's going to piss people off. Um, Manjaro. Manjaro. <laughs> 
<laughs> that has to be lower than ours, Conv right? Convince me it's not an F. I can't C convince me. I can't me. convince you that it's not an F. I, I could argue 4D because when it came out, Arch was hard to install and Manjaro made it easy. And the problem with that argument is that Arch is no longer e hard to install. Well, okay. But I've, I've said this so many times with Manjaro, but I need someone to explain to me how the entire idea of their distro is that they hold, or not the entire, but the main feature of their distro is they hold back the unstable packages from Arch on a two week window so that they can fix any problems, address any things that Arch causes so their users don't have to experience it. And they still push out the same broken updates that Arch does just two weeks later. Well, also by holding things like so, I can, holding things back isn't a bad thing. So, because OpenSUSE tumbleweed holds things back too. Okay, you're never going to run. No, it's not. But the problem is, is that with an Arch-based distro, a lot of people are going to want to use the AUR because the AUR is the primary benefit of using Arch, or at least one of the primary benefits of using Arch. And by holding things back, you break the AUR so many times because those dependencies aren't going to match up for version wise. Yeah, so so you end up, you hold back packages and you break the community packages, but then even on top of that, the whole idea behind you holding back packages is so you have time to fix any issues that come through with Arch. And if you don't fix those issues, what are we talking about? Why are you holding back packages? Why do you exist? What? All right. Like, we got to put it in. That's been my problem. Yeah, F tier is definitely going for Manjaro. Okay. All right. Gen 2. Where are we going to put Gen 2? Uh -huh. This would be good. I I would have to say this one's going to be different. I think Gen 2 deserves an A tier or a B tier only because f kind of the, for the same reasons that like Arch, like we were talking about with Arch, it genuinely does provide... Like a lot of distros and stuff wouldn't exist without it. And also Gentoo is kind of where a lot of other developers in the Linux space learn how to do things like package programs, how compiling actually works, especially when we're doing it outside of, you know, like <laughs> Nate, <laughs> hold on. My answer for Gentoo is compiling. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I could I could go I could go with anywhere from an S to C on Gen 2. I could see the arguments for literally any of those tiers. Uh, Where I, do you think it I should go? I think that Gen 2 has to be an S tier. I think that maybe this is coloring because it is so hard to install, but you can't install Gen 2 without learning something. Any other distro other than Linux from scratch on this list, you can and anybody can install. There's nothing to prevent you from installing it in like five seconds. You know, if you have a really fast computer, like right? within five minutes, you can install literally anything on this machine other than Linux from scratch and Gen 2. Now, just because it's hard to install doesn't necessarily make it good, but you can't install Gen 2 without learning something. And a lot of these distros, you can just install. You'll never learn a thing. It's just an installer. Yeah. And I think that just going through the process of installing Gen 2, you learn so much about Linux that it can't it can't help but be a, an S tier. So I think that it's an S tier, and I, I just don't th see how it could. I mean, I mean, A tier possibly, but I think I think that it's an S tier. Yeah, I would I would have to agree only because like LFS like. W w one of the main problems that I see with with LFS and that does make it so low on the list is sure you learn a lot but at the end of that 36 hours that you've spent like building this system do you have a usable package manager no can you install like do you, now do you know how to build packages properly for your system probably but do you do you know how to build a big package could you get steam installed no like trust me on god if you get lfs with steam installed brother you haven't seen the outside grass in six years <laughs> like, it, there's it's just not great gen 2 
yes, it is a, there's a massive learning curve. Uh, depending on your hardware, compiling can be extremely time consuming. But compiling is how all of the packages on every system work. Somebody's got to compile them. It, it, that, that's what happens with software. And you can use the system afterwards. You can learn how to use a functioning system. Also, I think, I think it might be an S tier just solely based off of Portage alone. Portage is, it, if you want a package manager that works extremely well, is pretty easy to learn and gives you literally infinite amount of options. You you could you could do pretty much anything with Portage. All right. It's a great package manager. S tier, our first one. All right. Let's go ahead. I mean, I, I have literally like 60 more distros to go. I don't think we're going to make it to all of these. But Ben said he was going to riot if we didn't rank Storm OS. So let's go ahead and do Storm, Storm OS next. <laughs> Sorry, Ben. This isn't going to be pretty. Ben, man. you're my friend. Okay, <laughs> so I want you to know this does not this does not have any impact on our friendship whatsoever. But I don't. I, I think it would be D or F tier. I've tried Storm OS before. It's got a lot of problems. At least when I tried it, I couldn't get it to work on hardware. It just didn't function properly for me. So it it would be D or F tier and. To be honest, uh, I don't. I also wouldn't rank pretty much any Arch-based derivatives very highly, like in general. Arco is probably one of the only few ones I'd rate highly anyway, yeah, just because Eric Dubois does right there with so you. So much. It's like, yeah, so much. Sorry, Ben. This hurts. This hurts, buddy. I'm sorry, but F tier. It's it's a it's a it's a good personal project. I just don't know. I mean, it's it's for you, bud. It, it, as long as it's your S tier, it doesn't matter. Let's go ahead and, and do the other one that's going to hurt a friend here soon as well. Uh, Zero Linux. Uh, I mean, it has to be D or F tier too. We're, we're ranking this with full knowledge that Zero Linux doesn't actually exist anymore, guys. So I don't think Steve yeah. is going to hurt us on this. So I think we'll put that right there along with Storm OS. It doesn't actually exist anymore. He's just doing... He, he's doing... He's going in another direction. Let's go ahead and do... Um, the fact that I okay, let's just everybody pause and and count the number of red core Linux I, uh, icons I have on the screen right now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven red core icons. <laughs> let's go ahead and do red core, shall we? Red core based on Gen two Linux, easy to install Gen two Linux, and has its own package manager, Sisyphus, which is the, still the worst thing for a dyslexic person to have to spell every single time. So where would you put Red Core Linux? To be honest, so j just I, I, I'm going to have to. Go Could you explain Red Core for a second okay. while I kind of look it up? Red Core is Gen I two, make sure. but it uses the Calamari's installer, so you don't have to install it in the Gen two way. And it has a Portage front end called Sisyphus that basically is a Python script that does everything that Emerge and Portage do. And he's the, the the dev has done a lot of work on making a very what's the word I'm thinking of? It's a, it's a very containerized version of make.conf and all of your use packages and stuff like that are all very separated and into their own files and stuff. So he's done a lot of work for that and he's created some tools that make Gen 2 better. Also, he he's basically created the Manjaro of Gen 2, where he takes the Gen 2 repositories and holds them back so that he knows that everything is is stable. Which, uh, given that Gen 2 has its own stable dist uh, repositories, I don't know really why it exists. Yeah. But well, um, it, it's definitely there. Okay. So I, I've read up. I, I I just wanted to make sure I was thinking of the right thing when I was talking about Red Core and everything. So after. After making sure I'm talking about the right thing, my opinion is going to be I this might upset some people, but I think it's I think it's going to be a D or an F tier only because and one of the main benefits of Redcore is the fact that it's easy to onboard Gentoo with binary packages that you're probably not going to find in regular Gentoo repositories. And Gentoo's just now released a, a binary, binary repository. Yeah, yeah. I I, so. I will say D tier simply because I used it for a couple months and I know that it is a good, very good distro that does provide some benefits, but I would also say that it makes it harder for you to go use Gen 2 instead of easier. Because 
if you're going to use Gen 2, the point of using Gen 2 is part of it is the installation because it's, it teaches you how to use Gen 2 along the way. Once you've installed Gen 2, you know how to use Gen 2. Whereas with Red Core, it really does install it for you. And you're not, if, especially if you only use Sisyphus, you're not going to learn how to use Portage. And if you just stick with binaries, you're not going to end up you're learning how to use use flags, which is like, if you're going to use Gen 2 and not use use flags, what are you using Gen 2 for? I mean, right? So I think I've talked myself into an F tier. Damn it. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I could go with D tier. And I, I think it definitely, with, with Gen 2's new updates and everything that Gen 2 is doing as of late, it could easily be dropped down to that F tier, but I think before Gen 2's binary repositories and stuff, like it should have been a D tier, and we'll keep it there. Right, D tier is yeah, fine. I think that's probably good. Okay, uh, let's go with the oldest of the ball, Slackware. I don't like Slack t Slackware at all. It should probably go in down into the F tier. It, as far as I know, as a distribution, it works for plenty of people. They can't even keep the site up. The site looks atro. I mean, atro I don't know if they've updated it, but the last time I looked at the site, it's atrocious. Like, it looks terrible. Also, as far as I know, I was talking with someone who used Slackware, so this could be completely wrong, and it very well could be. I don't know. I could have misunderstood. But from what I understood, like, the way it works is, like, you have to install every application inside of the repository or choose the ones that you don't want installed. I don't know if that's how it works, but that's how that's the impression I got from talking with somebody who uses it. And like, I don't want every package inside of a repository period. The fact that somebody just compared us to Chris Titus tech and called this a horrible tier list just makes them tier lists are opinions, bro. Just saying. It's an opinion. Go make your own damn tier list. But yes, we are trying to top it. <laughs> we, we would like it to be even more controversial. Go make your own damn tier list. <laughs> That's what I said. Uh, okay, so uh, I I've, I got angry there for a second. Well, we were doing Slackware, right? Uh, I would say D, -t D tier simply because it's been around for so long and it's fathered a whole bunch of Linux innovation. I mean, you learn how to do package management there to begin with because it existed before Gen 2. If we were to be ranking this in the early 90s, it would be S tier. As of right now, it's a D tier for me. I I will I will capitulate and we will go with D tier. All right. <laughs> it's good with me. Okay. Peppermint OS based on Debian. Basically, as far as I, I can tell, this is basically like Linux Lite is in, in ways, but it also has some tooling and stuff. So I, I'll be honest with you and say that I don't think I've used Peppermint OS in literal years. So I'm not that familiar with Same. it. I'm not familiar with it as of late. It's been a long time since I used it. Back when I did use it, based off of my experience with it, I'd probably give it a C tier. It's very close to Linux Lite, MX Linux. It's got a, it, it makes using something like Debian way simpler. It's got a lot of it's got a lot of pre-installed things that most average users are probably going to want installed anyway without bloat. You know, you're not going to find your freaking Candy Crush installed or whatever. You're not going to have a ton of like I I think Peppermint comes with a LibreOffice and that's pretty much the most bloated application you're going to get with it. So, and again, most people probably want an office suite anyway. Yeah. So I, to me, I, I think it would be C tier. They help out a lot of users. They do a lot and they kind of stand out from a lot of the D tier. Yeah, I agree, uh, I agree with you. C tier is a good one. All right, let's go ahead and move on to, right, so we just got a few more that we're going to do here. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to skip out on the Ubuntu flavors and just go ahead and do, let's do Ubuntu. Just regular, plain old stock, vanilla Ubuntu. Ubuntu of eight or 10 years ago, probably a S or a tier of the Ubuntu of today. I'd probably put down with like, at best I'm giving it a B tier because I think there's a lot of Ubuntu derivatives that do a better job than Ubuntu does anyway. So I don't know. B or C would be my answer for just stock Ubuntu. I'm, uh, I'm going to say this with everything. I can't see how we put this on the same tier as Linux Mint <laughs> or Fedora or Arch. <laughs> I just don't. I 
if you're running a server, I think that it's a good distro. I, I don't think that it's a good distro for the vast majority of people right now. So I would say C tier as well. And there goes the rest of my subscribers. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's go ahead. The next one is the granddaddy of them all, Debian. I, I, like, I don't know about where you're about on the list, but I, I'm thinking it's going to be higher up than Ubuntu. Only because Debian is quite easy to actually use, like by itself. Like, yeah, there is a lot of distros that make it easier. But if we're being honest, like messing around with straight Debian is probably easier than Ubuntu in a lot of cases. Even though Ubuntu makes it like they've got a lot of stuff. I don't know, man. I, I'd probably put them in. I'd probably put Debian in an A tier. Like it's just all right. I wouldn't say S tier. Let me make the argument for S tier. Know. Okay. Without Debian, Linux would not exist. Okay. You are literally correct, yes. every other distribution on here, even if it's not based on Debian, would probably not be here. Other than probably Slackware, maybe op maybe OpenSUSE, but probably not OpenSUSE because SUSE would probably just delete it. So there there are three granddaddies of them all. Debian is one of them. I don't think. Uh, I mean, we did rank Slackware very, but the thing about Slackware is that no one else is basing anything else on Slackware. Okay, not really. I mean, I'm sure there are derivative distros out there of Slackware, but no one else does. Debian powers Pop. It powers Linux Mint. It powers uh, MX Linux, Linux Lite, Peppermint, Ubuntu, uh, Solus, KDE Neon. Half of the things that are on this list are powered by Debian. And if Debian went away, they would all go away. So I think it has got to be an S tier. I would agree with that. Yeah. Debian, you've been crowned. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> let's go to, so let's see, there's, we need to do Open SUSE. Let's go ahead and do Open SUSE next. Oh, great. All right. Here comes the fight. <laughs> let's go. I'm going to say S tier because it's awesome. <laughs> And it literally, literally, Sousa can't go in an A tier. It starts with an S, okay? <laughs> well, but you see, the problem is, is I don't even think it gets A tier. I think it gets B tier. You, no, I'm sorry. A, <laughs> we, we gave your Nixa West an A tier. <laughs> yeah. See, here's here's my reason that I would say it goes in B is because OpenSUSE is really great if it works. I've I've tried Leap literally like I don't even know if Leap works. I haven't gotten it to boot on any machine. I've tried. Leap period. is in a weird place it, right now because it's going to be replaced. OK, it's not. <laughs> I, I, I know. I know. I know. That was a cheap shot. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're judging it too hard, man. Tumbleweed, let's just judge Tumbleweed. And I think that I, pulling back from my fanboyness, I would say A tier simply because if you do get it installed, first you prove that you know how to use Linux. Se that, that was a burn, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> second, second of all, it's one of the most stable rolling release distros you're ever going to see. Specifically, I'm talking about Tumbleweed, obviously. And once you have it installed, it's so very stable, has a ton of software available to it. And here's the kicker. We gave Pop! OS and we gave uh, a lot of other distros on here props because they had tools. There is no tool out there that is better and more comprehensive than Yast. It, it just doesn't exist. Yes, literally, if you want, you can do anything you want to do on Linux. You can use at Yes to do okay. it. Okay, you know what? You won me over. If, yep, as long as soon as you mentioned Yes, we'll give it an A tier. That is yes, that is hands down. Pretty much anyone that tries Open SUSE will say Yes is probably the best piece of software they've seen in a long time. It like, literally does everything. Now it's very good. It has its flaws. It definitely does look like it came from the from 1998. Yes, it uses Zipper as a backend, so it is slow. But as a tool, it's the most comprehensive tool you'll ever see. Literally, well, and literally also, everything. if we're being fair, even if you're coming from Windows, it looks very similar to a control center. Like yeah. you're not, you're not going to get confused at what what buttons do what. Like it's very simple and straightforward. So let's do. So there's two more that I want to do, and, and then we'll call this a day. Uh, there are more that many. I, if you're watching the video version, there are many more here that we could have done. 
and, and maybe we'll do this again someday. I, I don't know. I, I, we, we bit off more than we could chew. Turns out there's a lot of fucking Linux distros. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, <laughs> elementary OS is second to last. Ooh. Ooh. Like I do this too. <laughs> um, I really like it. So I want to be nice. But if we're being honest, it's probably a C or a D. Like, and here's, here's why. It would be, it would literally be a, a, an A or B tier. If, if it didn't have, like it, there's literally only one problem with elementary. They don't give you the flat hub just repo by default. So their software center is a barren wasteland. Like I really hope they fix that for the next version, but when is the next version coming out? Exactly. <laughs> like, like, like I, it feels like there's like one person developing elementary OS. You know there has to be a team behind it still, but they are the by the <laughs> the next LTS of Ubuntu will be released literally like days after the next elementary OS release, which means you'll be you know, like, you know that they'll be on like 22.04 when 24.04 is around. It's, it moves too slowly. It just moves too slowly. So I would argue for a D tier. They do a lot of really good stuff out of the box. They've put in a lot of work to make it a, a unique uh, environment. So I think it has to be better than an F tier, but it moves too slowly and on a De on a Debian slash Ubuntu based distro, it can't move that slowly. I mean, it uh, it already moves slow. To to be honest, I think our uh, I, I think me and you have have talked about this because we've talked about elementary quite a bit. But the only two problems with it are the fact that it's software center. Just give people flat hub ID. There's no excuse not to just do it. it if that's where ninety percent of your software is going to come from do it. Just add it in there by default. There's no reason to require the user to accept it, whatever. If they, your software center is already going to tell them it's a flat pack, it, there's no problem. Or Just if you want to, if, if you're so concerned about having control over the repository, FlatHub is open source. <laughs> it's not like Snap where you where it's proprietary. You could, if you wanted to, import the, the flat packs that you wanted to into your own repository and just mirror the ones that you want, you know, and then you could at least have things like LibreOffice and Firefox in your repository. And you, when someone Googled web browser, you, all you get is epiphany, you know, it's not like, like yep. it's simple. All right. So what do you think? D tiers where we want to go? Yeah. All right. There are three more that I want to do. I want to do Endeavor OS. I want to do, I lost the, the, I want to do Zorin and I want to do, maybe those are the only two left uh, that I really want to have anything to say about. Are there any other distros that, you, that we haven't ranked that you want to do? No, I I think we've done all the ones that all right. like, I really want to get to. Endeavor OS, let's talk about that for a minute. Where would you put Endeavor? Probably B tier. It's not uh, only because I don't think Endeavor is as... Fl like flushed out or as it, it doesn't have as much going on for it that Arco does, but it is really good. I don't know. It may, it may be up with Arco, but I would, I, I would say probably B tier is where I'd put it. Like, I mean, I've used it. It's rock solid. It works. They've got a lot of nice, nice stuff going on. 273 people are watching this right now. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> that's nuts uh welcome to everybody and uh by the way that i i had to go refresh the screen because vivaldi crashed that tab and i still can't see the chat so if you're saying anything to me in chat i apologize i can't see it i just i'm just hoping that the stream's actually still going because <laughs> i can't it is I, it I is I'm, I'm watching it and i'm watching you try to reload it and everything. <laughs> whatever reason basically it showed me a like you remember when like flash used to crash your browser tabs it's basically what just happened to this i don't know what's going on like i youtube are you still using flash all right so i agree b, b tier for endeavor os so the next one that i said last one i said i wanted to do was i've already forgotten oh zorn os zorn what do you think zorn where zorn would go dang it why do you do this to me it's gonna be d or f oh wow um, <laughs> yeah can because i to to me, I don't, I don't have a very high opinion of Zorin. Their pricing structure, I don't know if it's changed because I really don't keep up with them. Like, it's a distro that works, but 
like when you're char, I think like I'm pretty sure it was like a hundred dollars or like two hundred dollars, like a year or something like that, to unlock like a different layout for your desktop environment and a whole bunch of apps that they pre-installed for you. And and in their in their defense, they give you a whole bunch of support. Right, you can like lit- I think they like literally have someone you can call on the phone to get support. Yeah, but like if we're being honest, I'm doing like general like Linux support focused towards NixOS, and you can go and do my Patreon. I do that for eight dollars a month. So if you do the math on that, that's still less than it, and it's that's for support, like specialized support. Let me. I I don't okay, know. So, Maybe. Okay, so I think Zorn has a lot of the same problems that Elementary OS does, but it's better. It's better developed and better supported than Elementary OS, but they also have a problem where they are significantly behind when it comes to their updating. So they're still based on 22.4. It doesn't feel like the next version is going to be based on because tw- they literally just came out with a brand new version. 24.04 is three months away, or you know, two months away, two or three months away, right? So we won't get another version of Zorn until the fall, which by that time, 24 out of 4 will have been around for a long time. And, and so it feels like they have a lot of the problems that Elementary OS does. Uh, and so I would, on the other hand, they do a, a good job of, of supporting in the meantime where Elementary OS, the developers just kind of disappear in between updates. You never hear from them between updates, whereas the Zorn guys are always around. So I would argue for a C tier just because I think it's a little tad bit above Elementary OS. But I, I if, if you're very... I could, you yeah. know, no, I, I, I could do that C tier for Zorn. Yeah. Okay, that's, we'll, yeah. we'll, that's pretty we'll fair. We'll do that. C tier for Zorn. And again, uh, we can't see the chat to actually know whether or not uh, um, anybody's agreeing with us. I'm going to reload this one one last time see if I can't get the, the chat to load. I think it's because it's, it's popped out. Oh, there it is. All right, <laughs> uh, here we got it. A whole bunch of people said F. All right, let's let now, guys. I know that there's a whole bunch of distros here that we didn't get to. We didn't do, do Rocky or uh, like Sparky or any of those other ones. Like, there's a whole bunch of other ones here that we could have done, but we're running out of time. We've been going now for an hour and 34 minutes. We still have thingies of the week to do, and I'm quite sick of sitting in this chair. So, uh, I think that that's the, where we'll leave our tier list for now. Thanks everybody for watching that. That was a lot of fucking fun. I, I had, a, I yes, had a lot of entertaining to do that. We'll have to do some more tier lists in the future. We're not going to do tier lists all the time though, because that would be ridiculous, but we, we will do some tier lists of other things in the future. If, in, make sure you hit the subscribe button if you want to watch those things. So before we jump out of this podcast, we do have thingies of the week to do. So Tyler, let's go ahead and put our faces back up here. And you guys can actually see how dark it's gotten in the meantime. Cause it, Tyler is now yep. sitting in the dark. <laughs> it, yep. it was, I could only bring one light with me, man. And with this DSLR, this one light don't do crap. <laughs> it, 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 it was light when we started. He, he's not light anymore. So that's how yeah. long we've been going for. So let's go ahead and jump into the nuggies of the week. Tyler, your nuggy of the week. Ah, oh, yes, I am quite happy with this one so for anybody who hasn't like i don't know tried out nix os yet uh if you're going to start using it and you're playing around with it you're having a pretty decent time but you'd like to do some more cool like theming stuff uh, i highly recommend you check out the there's a nix os module called nix colors it is a great way of managing themes. It ha- it pulls from the base 16 color repository. So you've got a, a ton of themes, you know, your Tokyo night themes, grub box, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on. So if you, if you want to do some cool things with theming and having one theme that you can easily switch and replicate it across your GTK themes, QT application configs, all that stuff, it's definitely something to check out. I had a lot of fun with it. I've been using it now for a while. I may have talked about Nick's colors on the podcast before. I can't remember, but definitely go check it out. If you're going to look in looking, if you're looking into Nick's OS or potentially going to stay for a while, it's, it's fun to play around with. Your, your thingies of the week or your nuggies of the week are going to be very Nick centric for the, for uh, the foreseeable feature. Aren't they? Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, 
my nuggy of the week is actually two. I have two. So for the longest time, I'm a big reader. I read dozens of books every single year, but I for for my entire life, all I've done is physical books. Like if I'm going to read a book, I have to have it in my hand. But I I live in a very small house. I've run out of room for books. Um, and in the winter, I live in Michigan. It's not always easy to get to the district library. So, um, I, I've sadly had to abandon my quest for owning all the books, uh, in physical form. So I, I've been looking into ways of getting, uh, digital books and Kindle books is obviously the way to go. If you want to buy digital books, get it from Kindle or from Barnes and Noble or whatever, but I don't want to pay for every book that I read because like I DNF a lot of books throughout the year. So I've found two apps called Hoopla and Lib Libby. L-I-B-B-Y. Basically, what they allow you to do is if you have a, a library card and your library supports it, they basically allow you to download or basically rent a copy of books that the library has in digital EPUB form. And you can read them either on Kindle or in the, the app that's provided in case, the case of Hoopla. And they have access to all the new releases and stuff and old releases, basically, if your library supports it. And you can, if you don't have a district library, find libraries out there that don't have a residency requirement. So you can get a library card from them. So I have... Uh, the, the cool thing about Libby in particular is that you can be a member of many different libraries if you, you have a reciprocal agreement with libraries or you found libraries that don't have a residency agreement. You can put them all in Libby and that means that you can have if the you'll have more selection of the books. So if, if you know, every book, ha every library has only so many books available of a certain title or whatever, the more libraries you have, the more likely you are to be able to actually rent one of those books. So Hoopla and Libby, they're awesome. And as long as you have a library card of some form, the vast majority of libraries do support them uh, both. And uh, like I live in Podunk and, and or BFE as we you know call it, and my little ass district library supports it. So um, definitely check those out if you're a reader and you like to and you don't want to actually have to you know buy books all the time. So yeah, those are my nuggies of the week. So that is it for a awesome uh, episode of the Linux cast. I, I really highly enjoyed this. We're definitely going to have to do a tier list again. I, I, I've i been mixed on tier lists because I think that there's like that one guy who says, well, this is a stupid tier list. It's it's their opinions, dude. Like seriously, that's the well, reason they're why all I, stupid. They're like all, they're all they're, yeah. like, like there's no good Linux distros. They're all, they all suck. Use windows. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, anyways, uh, that's it for this episode. If you want to get in contact with us, you can do so in any number of ways. Probably the best is to head on over to the website, which is available at the linuxcast.org. There you'll find previous episodes all the way back to season one and uh, even more recent episodes because I've actually been keeping that up to date. Also, you'll be able to find all of my previous blog posts there as well. You can follow Tyler, who does a very NixOS centric YouTube channel now. But he's on YouTube at youtube.com slash zanyog. And uh, we're, we're just waiting for him to lose the password again. Because it will happen, <laughs> happen eventually. Uh, and no, no, he, he's a great YouTuber. And he's you're coming up on, what, 5,000 or 4,000 uh, subscribers? I think I'm at 50... I think I'm. I think I'm over five thousand. So you're coming I up think on like fifty four. You're coming up on six thousand or something. So if you haven't subscribed, to, head on over there. Subscribe to his channel, especially if you like Nick's OS. Links for his Discord and my Discord will be on the website as well. So make sure you check out that as well because they're really. Uh, let's see how many, how many times I can say as well in the same sentence. Just to say. Uh, anyways, uh, youtube.com slash linuxcast if you want to subscribe to my channel patreon.com slash linuxcast if you want to support me monetarily, Tyler also has a Patreon, that link will be on the, the website as well, you find all the stuff at the linuxcast.org slash contact, that's where you'll find all the links to my Mastodon, Tyler's Mastodon, Tyler's Discord, my Discord all that stuff, and you can just head on over there, if you want to support the channel and get awesome merch, head on over to the store which is available at shop shop.thelinuxcast.org uh, there you'll find a whole bunch of merch and it all goes directly to help the, sh the, the podcast as well so thank you so very much for everybody who has done that thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube and Kofi you guys are awesome without you the challenge would not be anywhere near where it is and we wouldn't have a podcast every week because I would have no motivation to do so I, half the time I get up in the morning just to see your guys' lovely faces um, that's depressing as hell 
<laughs> anyways thanks everybody who does support me thanks everybody for watching this was by far our most watched live stream ever not even like doubled I think the last highest one. So thank you so very much for watching live. We record this live every Saturday, usually around 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, if one of us doesn't decide to rebuild our PCs literally right before the podcast. Um, I'm not naming names. Um, <laughs> uh, anyways. I don't know uh, who would do such a thing. Head on over and watch us live on YouTube.com slash LinuxCast. We'll see you next week with a brand new topic. See you then. Boy.